Hi, everyone, and welcome to Microbial Minutes. This is ASM's every weekly uh, update on what's hot in the microbial sciences. I'm Julie Wolf, a uh, science communication specialist here at ASM. And today is the Scientific Controversies edition. We're going to talk about a couple of issues within the scientific community that are a little bit controversial. The first of these is based on a science report, a science uh, news article, which was released earlier this month. Uh, the take home message is that gain of function research of concern, is proceeding with caution. Uh, and I think this is a very good issue to talk about on Microbial Minutes because a lot of this gain-of-function work has to do with microbiology specifically. So what is gain-of-function? It's the added ability uh, conferred through research means of something to cause greater harm. Uh, so this, you could imagine this might have something to do with a chemical, but a lot of it has to do with microbes, bacteria, and viruses that are given additional capabilities to be more easily transmitted, to be drug resistant, uh, perhaps even to have a greater virulence to cause a, a worse course of disease, which is a dangerous thing for a researcher to work with should that uh, microbe no longer be contained within the lab in which it's being studied. Now, gain of research really came to prominence. It came to the cultural forefront uh, in 2012, 2011, when two researchers who are pictured here in the slide, um, Yoshi Yoshihiro Kawasaka, nope, I'm sorry, Kawaoka, and Ron Fauchier, uh, they were both working on avian influenza. And as uh, they were both working independently in different labs and, in fact, in different countries. They were looking at the ability of the H5N1 avian influenza strain to pass between ferrets. Now, H5N1 is a, a terrible disease when it is passed from birds to people, uh, and it has a pretty high mortality rate, 30 to 50 percent mortality rate, but it's not transmitted very easily from person to person. Both of these individuals were um, conducting research in their labs to look at the transmission of H5N1 between ferrets and developing strains that would be able to more easily transmit between ferrets. And ferrets transmit in avian influenza uh, very similarly to how humans do. So the thought is that any more easily transmissible strain that they developed in their labs would also be able to be more easily transmitted within the human population, um, potentially being a, at great risk for human health. And so this led to the moratorium on gain-of-function research, uh, which was imposed in 2014 by the U.S. government. The U.S. government said, hey, we should slow down, maybe not fund all of these studies. Let's think about different types of biocontainment strategies, for example. Uh, there have, for example, in the past, been examples of uh, different types of mistakes that have been made by researchers where, for example, um, uh, let's say anthrax spores were not totally um, inactivated before being sent out, or a lab may send the, the wrong strain of influenza. Uh, and we also may recur, uh, you may recall the, the incidence of finding smallpox that was stored for decades within the CDC. So taking that into consideration, the, there were a few workshops which were held at the National Academy of Sciences, uh, and this led to a new policy for evaluating the potential for generating these enhanced potential pandemic pathogens. So these are potential pandemic pathogen, pathogens, such as avian influenza, that have even enhanced um, capabilities. Based on these, uh, based on these thoughts and these workshops, the NIH lifted the moratorium and announced this in 2017, and this led to um, new reporting requirements for the people who are working in these different labs. Uh, Kawaoka, for example, is now required to report every time that uh, there is a strain th that his lab develops that has any of these potential capabilities, something that might be resistant to an antiviral drug, something that is transmissible between ferrets, or something that is a more virulent strain of influenza. Uh, and so on the next slide, we'll see what the big deal is now. So why is this research, um, or why is this policy coming to the forefront yet again? There have been several articles that have been touched on by the mainstream media, um, which I think is bringing this to not only the scientific population, but to the greater community uh, in general. 
However, as you can see from the titles of the New York Times article and the Washington Post article, which were um, published within the last week, these are quite inflammatory in, in the headlines that they're writing. And, and here, I should say I'm speaking as Julie Wolf, not necessarily as the American Society for Microbiology. But if we look at the New York Times title here, studies of deadly flu virus, once banned, are set to resume. The government will allow research on bird flu that had been halted over safety concerns. But officials have not publicly announced the decision nor explained how it was made. And in an editorial in the Washington Post, the U.S. is funding dangerous experiments it doesn't want you to know about. Now, both of those um, headlines took me a little bit by surprise because on our Microbial Minutes sessions, we had discussed the lifting of this moratorium in January 2018, shortly after the moratorium was lifted, and this was covered by several major news outlets. Uh, so I have a little screenshot here just to remind you that we have discussed this on the past, and you can go ahead and rewatch that if you want to uh, learn a little more about how that announcement was made. Now, it seems to me when when looking at proponents and opponents of this gain-of-function research that you can lump the different arguments into um, a few different categories. So people who think that the gain-of-function research poses too high of a risk generally cite these accidents of sending out um, dangerous types of microbial strains that should not have been. Uh, they also cite that there is not transparency in the approval process. Uh, so although the moratorium is lifted, how grants are assessed, how they are peer-reviewed, how they are considered to potentially cause too great of risk rather than the benefit that the, the studies might confer is not transparent, uh, according to these opponents. Um, and additionally, approval for grants, individual grants, has not been announced. And I think that this, this last point is particularly surprising because a lot of grants do not get individual announcements. However, um, it's true that there could be a little more transparency within the process. Now, proponents for the gain-of-function research um, uh, resuming say that this gain-of-function, uh, this additional capabilities, can help researchers to learn about the biology of pathogens and potentially lead to treatments or vaccines for these different pathogens. Uh, these, these different experiments have also already helped with surveillance practices. So some of the mutations which were found to allow ferret transmission of avian influenza have actually been found within wild bird populations. And the, the knowledge that these mutations are starting to acquire in the uh, natural population of avian influenza help those in the public health sector who are doing surveillance for different types of flu sequences know that these might arise early. Um, and we can be on the lookout for that. So in this same New York Times article, um, there was a quote from Tony Fauci, who's the head of the NIH, um, where he said that of Dr. Kawaoka, uh, that he did go undergo the appropriate vetting exercise. It went through multiple layers of review and examination, uh, and that it was appropriately vetted with all appropriate caveats. So here on the next slide, I do want to point out that ASM does have an official stance um, about the decision to lift the moratorium on this gain-of-function research in support of lifting the funding pause, but also in support of the new review framework, which is outlined in a document that is um, hyperlinked within the, the statement itself. Now, we'll add links to the ASM statement as well as to these different articles so that you can look through this yourself and let us know what you think about the gain-of-function research. Um, but uh, for now, this is an ongoing conversation. It does seem that the, um, that the research will be ongoing after it has been vetted uh, for safety and assessed for potential risk. All right, moving on. We're next going to talk about uh, an article from Nature. Uh, the take-home message from this is that complex molecules called cannabinoids have been successfully produced in yeast. So cannabinoids are a family of molecules from the cannabis sativa plant, also known as the marijuana plant. And this is something that is becoming of great commercial interest as marijuana laws are changing throughout the United States. Many of these canna cannabinoids have been studied um, for their medicinal properties, uh, though studying them in singular can be a little bit difficult. There are dozens of these different cannabinoids that are made at different concentrations by various strains of the, of the plants themselves and purifying them so that you can study the individual molecule interactions with say a host pain receptor can be quite challenging. 
Um, and this is in part because there's large metabolic networks. There are many different um, genes that are involved in making and generating these different cannabinoid molecules. So to um, help to synthesize these in a more structured and, and regulated format, scientists have engineered the genes from uh, can cannabis sativa into baker's yeast or brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, in order to make five of the major cannabinoids using galactose as a starter molecule. Um, and so we'll look at some of the pathways in the next slide. So the cannabinoid biosynthetic genes were added into Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, and the strains were made so that they would either make a THC um, a, which is a tetrahydrocannabolic acid, um, uh, or they would make the CBD, which is uh, cannabidiol, uh, and it will make a precursor, either THCA or CBDA, which can then be processed, but they would just make one of those um, on their own, which come from a, a, the same precursor here. Um, and those were all from the cannabis sativa plant themselves. Now, THC is the uh, molecule within uh, marijuana that has those uh, psychedelic properties, and CBD has been associated um, without any having any psychedelic properties, but it, it does have some medicinal purposes. So being able to isolate these uh, and produce them without any risk of contamination has an obvious benefit. Now, to study even um, additional changes within these molecules and modifications, the researchers took some genes from five different bacteria in order to um, add in this hexanol uh, coenzyme A biosynthetic pathway, which you can see uh, in the blue here, um, marked in the, the upper right-hand part of that little diagram. This allows the cannabinoids to be synthesized and purified um, from the yeast themselves, and the scientists can then test the various effects of these um, molecules, either individually or with known concentrations in concert together. This also will allow um, scientists using this same mechanism to produce cannabinoids that are produced at um, low abundance, so they're not very easy to isolate from the plants themselves. Uh, and then they can be generated at higher compounds and tested to see if some of those low abundance molecules also have biological effects uh, and potential health benefits to human beings. So on the next slide, we will see that there were a number of different places where this was written up. Um, this was written up in Wired. Um, Nature itself re released a news article about it. And the lead scientist, Jay Kiesling, uh, had a number of different points that he made in these various outlets, um, such as uh, in the Wired piece, he was quoted as saying, being able to produce that uh, in a way that's uncontaminated. And in this case, he's referring to that CBD that's not psychoactive being able to produce um, that CBD in a way that's uncontaminated with THC is a pretty valuable thing. Uh, this would allow, for example, CBD experiments with um, epileptic patients. So CBD has known effects to benefit epileptic patients. Uh, this could be applied in a way that has no psychoactive activity. Uh, and in nature, um, a um, cannabis analyst uh, predicted that it would, although this was um, something that has, has been verified and they can actually generate these these compounds, that to make them at the concentrations necessary for, for commercial sale, this analyst predicts that it will be another 18 to 24 months before these synthetic cannabinoids are cost effective uh, to sell, uh, which is actually a pretty quick turnaround when you think about the, the ability to generate a new strain and to ramp it up and start scaling up uh, to concentrations necessary to make that commercially viable. Finally, I want to point out that um, making these, these molecules in yeast is not the only way that scientists are trying to improve cannabinoid synthesis. There was recently, uh, within the last month, another research article that was published in Nature Communications uh, in which scientists are trying to enzymatically and biochemically synthesize some of these compounds without using any cells at all. And we'll add a link to that as well as to some of these news articles and the research article itself down below uh, the session here. So that's going to summarize our two major research findings, uh, two major uh, microbiology issues of the last week. Uh, to summarize on the last slide, the important events in the microbial sciences, uh, we now have seen that gain-of-function research of concern is proceeding with caution. Uh, and I'd be very curious to know what you think about that. Please leave a comment uh, down below after you've read through some of those documents and, and let us know what you think about that. 
Uh, and the second story was that complex molecules, cannabinoids, have been successfully produced in yeast. And this has a, a lot of economic um, potential moving forward. Uh, I'd like to thank you for listening. We have this event every week, and you can go ahead and subscribe in our YouTube channel if you're interested in getting a notification for our next Microbial Minutes. If you want to support ASM uh, and productions like these, go ahead and click our membership, um, our membership link also down below. Uh, I'd like to thank Ray Ortega for, pod for production, um, and I will speak with you next week on Microbial Minutes.